Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So Rafi, today we continue with Surah Al-Inshira. This is another Surah that was revealed in Makkah. So, and this is actually when I, when I start off uh, uh, re reading the opening verses, you will see it's very much linked to the pre previous Surah Doha. The way that it starts and the way, and the things that Allah is talking about is very much paired with the previous Surah. So Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, did we not expand for you your chest? Now, expanding, expanding your chest means uh, that did we not give you guidance? Did we not you know, give you a nur and enlighten you? And expanding your chest can also mean did we not give you the courage and the conviction to be able to, um, you know, to handle this entire group of people who, is, who are there in Makkah and who are challenging you and saying all kinds of mean things to you? You know, it was very difficult, but we, we gave you the courage and the determination <clears throat> to be able to deal with them. So that's what it also means to expand your chest, right? So a task that seemed to be impossible was actually easily accomplished by just one man who changed the entire world and the entire concept of Tawheed. You get it? So then Allah is saying, did we not expand for you your chest? And did we not remove from you your burdens? which had weighed upon your back. Now, if you link this to the previous surah, do you understand what were the kind of burdens that he was facing? Um, that he was not getting revelation for a long period of time, and then his uncle and many other people started to come up to him and make fun of him. Right, okay. <clears throat> so he was facing the burden of ignorance because he was dealing with such ignorant and mean people. But if you remember the verses of Surah Doha, if you remember the verses where Allah says, did we not find you this and, and give you this? Did we uh, not? That he used to be an orphan. He used to be an orphan and Allah, he made it easy for him, granted him food, shelter, and you know, this uh, immense love and protection. And in, in a place like Makkah, where people are used to abusing pe uh, kids who are orphans. And then... Or did we not uh, guide you? Exactly. So you were living in a situation where there was ignorance. Everyone around you was ignorant. and They did not understand exactly uh, the, the message of, of the one God. And you, when you would see this level of ignorance, it would make you so angry and it would make you so frustrated. Right? And therefore, did we not give you guidance? Did, did, did we not make it easy for you? And also, something else was mentioned in Surah Doha. Uh, the fact that we made you financially strong. Right? Because if you, if you remember, I told you that when uh, his, both his parents passed away, what did uh, he inherit? All he inherited was one slave boy. One slave uh, and a she-camel. She right. So in other words, Allah is saying that over time, we made it so easy for you that you went into this business and you became this great partnership with Hazrat Khatija, who ended up being a very, very rich businesswoman. And she ended up liking you and she ended up you know, having this, uh, this desire to marry you. So you... Uh, suddenly became free of any need in the sense that you became financially strong, right? So when Allah now talks about the burden that was on your back, he's talking about ignorance, the ignorance that was there in Arabia. He's talking about financial problems, which suddenly, you know, Allah was able to remove all of that. He's talking about the fact that you were an orphan and Allah made sure you were still given protection and love. So has he not always been there for you? He has, and so he always will be there for you. And then furthermore, Allah says, and he raised high for you your reputation. So uh, in other words, right now, of course, at that time, people were calling him all kinds of names. But Allah was saying, ultimately, if you think about it, I have chosen you to be my prophet. So you are not just an average human being anymore. You are something very special. And of course, at this moment in time, it's hard, for, you know, it's hard to understand because he was facing a very d difficult situation, but Allah was giving him this guarantee that you are not just a prophet for now, you are going to be a prophet raised to a very high status till the end of times, because guess what? There are billions of Muslims who are about to enter this deen, and they all are going to be loving you, and they all are going to be wanting to follow you. So that's a huge, that's an elevation in his status. So Allah says, for indeed with hardship, there is ease. Indeed, with hardship, there is ease. Now, this means two things. Whenever there is difficulty, after difficulty, there will be ease. So in other words, you were, you were uh, uh, eventually an orphan. It was very sad for you. Your father passed away. Your mother had passed away. But eventually, Allah made things easy. 
you had a lot of financial difficulties, eventually Allah made it easy. You were seeing all this ignorance and eventually Allah made it easy. So there is difficulty, but after difficulty, what is definitely coming? Ease. Ease. Allah, Allah is not going to say difficulty and now more difficulty and now more. He's going to have difficulty, then, then there will be a period of ease. So for instance, when you look at the time that he had over there in Makkah, a lot, a lot of difficulty, but then Allah gave ease in the sense that Hazrat Hamza and Hazrat Umar two powerful men embraced Islam, okay? And then you have, of course, the entire social boycott, a, a massive period of difficulty, but eventually, uh, simply it's something that they thought would actually be impossible, but because of another uh, tribe that intervened, the entire boycott ended, okay? The entire boycott ended after a couple of years. And so that, again, after a period of difficulty, you see a period of ease. Then you have the year of sadness. Uh, his wife had passed away. His uncle had passed away. Then the incident of Taif had, had uh, taken place. Another period of difficulty. Allah, at the end, granted him ease. How? By giving him that night journey and the journey where he went up to the heavens. So after difficulty, ease is coming. But then after ease, what's coming? Difficulty. difficulty and then after that it's ease so in other words Allah is preparing us that there will be the cycle of ease and difficulty and ease and uh, and difficulty so whenever you're facing problems don't think that's it my life is over ease is coming and what this also means is that inside difficulty there is ease in other words every time you're going through a test or a difficulty there is a silver lining in that test find it so uh, what that also means is your difficulty could have been a million times worse. But Allah has put ease even inside that difficulty. And that's the, the silver lining that you have to understand. And uh, that's also very important because what that means is that when you are going through a period of hardship, Allah is not just sitting there and watching you. Allah is guiding you and he's helping you even in that period of difficulty. For example, when you look at the Battle of Trench, when suddenly, you know, they saw this army of 10,000 people, they're, they're, they're coming towards them. And they, they were so terrified and the Muslims could not understand what is the only way out. And they, they realized that, okay, the trench has been successful. But next they found out that the Quraysh are making a peace treaty with the people of Banu, Banu Quraysh. And so now they're thinking, oh no, another a period of difficulty. Now we're doomed. Okay, Allah did not send any angels, but Allah put it into the mind of one of them that why don't you talk to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, get permission and try to break the peace treaty. Now that, that is ease being granted during a time of difficulty. And then the fact that this man was able to go and he was able to convince both, uh, you know, both the people that he's very sincere and he was able to break that, that peace treaty is also something that Allah put barakah in. So Allah is saying, even in difficulty, I will grant you ease. So don't think Allah has just thrown me into hardship. Now he's just sitting there and he's just watching me. Even in that difficulty, he's helping you. And so then Allah says, uh, so when you have finished, then stand up for worship and to your Lord, turn all your attention. In other words, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is being told after all the things that I have done, there is ease inside difficulty and there is ease even after difficulty. So now when you're done with all your duties during the daytime, you have so many people you have to talk to, you have to propagate the message of Islam. There are people saying mean things to you. When you're done with all of that, because you have to do it, then if, and you come back home and you're finally free, then stand up for ibadat. Now is your time to spiritually uh, strengthen yourself because your ruh cannot take it. <clears throat> When you spend the entire day hearing lots of negative, mean, bad things, your rue is like a battery, it gets drained. You need to basically rejuvenate that rue. And so Allah is saying the best way to do it is when you're back home, peaceful, quiet, stand up now and try to build that connection once again with your Lord. So it will energize that rue once again. And so Allah is saying then turn all of your attention to Allah. So the next surah, Surah Teen. <clears throat> surah Teen is another beautiful surah with a lot of interesting hints uh, inside of it for people who tend to have this idea that oh, I'm just a failure. There's nothing left in my life. I'm no good. Complexes, inferiority complex, depression. A very interesting surah for that. <clears throat> so Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I swear by the fig and I swear by the olive. So Allah swearing by the vatin vazetun, the teen and the zetun, okay? And then he's saying, I swear by the, by the Mount Sinai. 
In other words, it was Tura Sinin. So he's now swearing by the Mount Sinai. And then he says, I also swear by this secure city. Now, uh, that, of course, is uh, talking about the city of Makkah because that is where the surah was revealed. And it's also a secure city because, as I told you, even in the period of ignorance, you could not have any fights. You could not have bloodshed or violence in the city of Makkah. And then Allah says, we have certainly, after taking all of these promises, after taking all of these oaths, what is the statement that he's giving? We have created insan in the best possible mold. So in terms of his external and his internal features, we have created him in the best possible design. But then if you think about it, you know, he's taking an oath by a fig, an oh, olive. What's a fig? A fig is a fruit. A fig, an olive, a mountain, a city. And he's saying, I swear by all these things, you have been created in the best possible design. And you have to understand what is the link. Because is uh, well uh, guarded, uh, like your body, uh, you know, because it has um, uh, many things that can pr uh, protect you. And what about a mountain uh, and a fruit because and an olive? Uh, uh, the mountain being because your body is very firmly built. Okay. Uh, there's no, like, you know, mistakes in it. Okay. Uh, the olive, uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Well, you're thinking that's nice, but if you think about it, a mountain is firmly built, but then so many other things are beautifully made, like the galaxy, the universe, the planets, the stars, right? Yeah. Can't just oh, be the mountain. Oh, but the mountain is, you know, extremely strong. Well, okay. But then if you think about the fig and olive, you know, these are very small and weak things. So let me tell you that the fact that, you know, you're thinking along those lines is very important. You have to try and, and, and ask yourself, what is the link between these oaths and the statement? So first of all, uh, when you look at the fig, the fig is uh, believed to be a place, uh, it's a fruit, and it is found in abundance in Mount Judy, which also happens to be the place where the Ark of Nuh ended up resting. So in other words, when you think about the fig, it is actually linked to a mountain. It's linked to Mount, uh, Mount Ararat, which is the name of the entire mountain range. And in specific, Mount Judy, where there is a proliferation, there is an abundance of fig available over there. Okay. Then he swears by the olive. Now, when you look at the Bible, Allah mentions that Isa salam over there, in the Bible it is mentioned, Isa salam used to always give his sermons to Bani Israel standing on the Mount of Olives. It is always called the Mount of Olives, and that's what it is mentioned in the Bible. And this place is in Jerusalem, right? So that's why when Allah is swearing by the olives, it is linked to Isa alayhi salam. When he's swearing by the fig, it is linked to Nu alayhi salam, okay? Then Allah swears by Mount Sinai, that is linked to Musa alayhi salam. Then he swears by city Makkah, that is linked to Muhammad, peace be upon him. So Allah is saying, and then he, he does not say, I've created prophets in the best possible design. He says, I've created insan, but insan means you and me. So he's saying, I've made you in the best possible way, externally and internally. Your qualities, your strengths, your ability to achieve things, your intellect. I've given you the best possible things. And if you have doubt, if you think that you don't, just look at these four amazing prophets. Because all four were human beings. That is the kind of ability I have given you. Now the question is, which I used to ask that, okay, I get that, but why Nu and Isa and Musa and Muhammad peace be upon them? I mean, there were many prophets. If you dig deeper, these uh, four prophets were not just prophets, but they also brought about a radical change. Nu salam represents the entire re-beginning of mankind. Because after that, the entire mankind had been, had, you know, was completely destroyed. Even all animals and species were destroyed. Everything restarted with Nu salam and his ark. It is initiation of a new beginning, a change, right? Go, all uh, disbelievers, all evil perished, and now entire mankind has started again from scratch. Understand? Isa salam was not just a prophet. He was not just a rasul. He was called a messiah. And, uh, and uh, being a messiah means he's, he was uh, a leader. That's what it actually means to be called someone you know, who's a messiah. He's a leader. He's like a king who is there to lead a group of people, who's there to lead a nation. Uh, no other prophet is called this. It's just Isa alayhi salam. Because his job 
was to actually reinstate the kingdom of Israel. And Ummat was already there, but the Ummat was not doing its job because the Ummat had no power. His job was to reestablish that powerful Ummat. That's why he's called the Messiah, right? a special title. He was supposed to bring that change. All right. In the same way, Musa, salam, he was the, the founder of the Ummat of Bani Israel. He's the one who converted and changed Bani Israel from being a Qom to an Ummat. Prior to that, they were a qom. It was only after Musa salam, that they became an ummat, that they were given this entire, uh, they were given the status of becoming a leader. You see a transition, you see a change, right? And Muhammad, peace be upon him, of course, brought the ultimate transition and change from a world that was immersed in ignorance to a world that was now going to be given this nur and this light of Allah. It's a transition and change from darkness to light. Because in the entire world at that time, nobody had, uh, uh, nobody understood the exact message of God. There was so much anarchy and so much confusion. The message of God had been distorted everywhere. So he brought all that darkness, people out of that into the light. So Allah is saying, you and me have the ability of doing what? Um, trying to do the same. Which is? Spread Islam. Wow, that's pretty brief. I mean, based on what I just told you and what these people have done, mm -hmm. could you elaborate? What exactly are we capable of doing? Has Allah given us so many strengths that we can ace exams, we can be, you know, we can uh, have this amazing career because that's what we were created for? No. So? It's basically uh, to struggle and you know, to, to fight for the cause of Islam. To bring change. Me and you have the ability of being an instigator. We can bring change. So the fact that I'm just a, you know, a normal human being and so are you does not mean oh, there, there's nothing I can do. Each and every one of us has the potential of not just getting, you know, uh, good grades and having a good career and being able to make money, that's, we are just constraining and limiting ourselves. Allah is saying, well, there's so much more you can do. And if you have doubt, look at Nuh alayhi salam. Look at Isa alayhi salam. Look at Muhammad peace be upon him. Look at Musa alayhi salam. They all were human beings for a reason Allah chosen to be human beings. They all initiated and brought about change. They all were able to move an entire kingdom of people. Musa alayhi salam had to had to train 600,000 people that you are not a qom anymore, you are an ummat. And this is what it means to be an ummat. Muhammad peace upon him was single man in the entire Arabia. Every, every single person was against him. And he was able to bring light and change that entire Arabia into Islam. Okay? So Allah is saying you have the ability to do so much more, but you just sit around underestimating yourselves. I, I cannot do this. I'll never be able to accomplish this. Right? And so Allah says, this is what I've made you, best possible design. But then he says, eventually, summa, eventually, we return him to the lowest of the low. So we made him best possible design. But then he becomes lowest of the low, which means lower and worse than animals. Even worse than them. So that amazing intellect that we've given him, he just throws it away. Because he uses it only for dunya. Except for those who believe and do good deeds, for they will have a reward uninterrupted. Now, Allah says we actually return him. That doesn't mean Allah pushes you down and makes you the lowest of the low. It means you decide, you choose, and Allah then makes that path easy for you. So Allah is saying, I made you amazing, and this is what you ended up doing to yourself. And then Allah says, so what yet causes you to deny the day of recompense? Is not Allah the most just of judges? So in other words, Allah is saying that based on the fact that I have made you in the best possible design, I've given you so much intellect, did you not think that I would have a day where I would uh, you know, hold you accountable and I would ask you, how did you use it? Am I not the best of judges? Do you think you can stand in front of me and complain and say, Allah, you didn't give me anything, I'm sorry. Allah spent my entire year crying in depression. I complete, completely forgot that I was supposed to do something for Islam. Right? Allah is saying, I'm the best of judges, I know so the next is we have Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is Surah Al-Alaq, the first, uh, the first revelation, right? 
And it's believed unanimous decision by all the scholars that the first five uh, verses represent the first revelation given to the Prophet when he is there in Ghare Hira, the cave of Hira. He's meditating day in and day out because he's so he's so upset with all the ignorance that he can see uh, in Arabia. He really wants to connect w with, with God, but he doesn't exactly know who God is. And then Jibreel salam, comes in the form of a man. And this is now the first revelation that is received. And it says, Ikra. Now, Ikra means to read. So that's why some scholars believe that uh, Jibreel came and he presented him with a tablet or with a paper, something that had st that had these words, these verses which were there on it and he was being told, read, read, right? So it said, read in the name of your Lord who created. Now, who created what? But it just says who created because the idea, the fact is he created everything. Every single thing that you can imagine or that you can even think of, well, he made it. So that's why read in the name of your Lord who created. And then in specific, there's one specific creation that Allah created, which he really will, uh, you know, which he wants to focus on right now, which is created man from a clinging substance. So created man from something so insignificant, so small and so deformed. Uh, inside the uterus that you know he wasn't capable of doing anything and then Allah is saying that I created him shaped him formed him gave him an intellect gave him the best possible design go back to Surateen best possible design he wasn't capable of doing anything so think in particular about that creation of mine and that creation of course for which um, he, he will be held accountable and so then Allah says again, read and your Lord is the most generous who taught by the pen, taught man that which he did not know. So whenever you see the words read and you see the words pen, it is talking about knowledge. Right. So Allah is saying all the knowledge that there is there in this world is knowledge I have given you. So acquire as much knowledge as you can. That's why I made your brain so intellectual. That's why what? Uh, Rafi was the first demonstration of Adam al First, Oh, uh, he was asked to give, uh, you know, basically all the knowledge that he had. The names. He was asked to, uh, uh, Allah showed him some, some things and he said, okay, give me the names. As it was a demonstration of his knowledge. That he has this superior, incredibly superior intellectual mind. And so this is now reinforcing that where Allah is saying, read, gain knowledge, who taught you, and he talks about the pen. The fact that we can actually find information, we can store information, we can write it down, and we can record it so that later generations can read it, learn from it, and add to it. That is what the pen actually symbolizes. So Allah is saying, gain knowledge, not just deen, not just Quran, all kinds of knowledge. Because the more you study it, the more you'll be able to appreciate Allah and his creations. And then Allah says, no, but indeed man transgresses because he sees himself as being self-sufficient. You know, I don't need anyone. Indeed, to your Lord is going to be the return. Have you seen the one who forbids? Now, this is believed to be talking about a certain person. Have you seen the one who forbids a servant when he's praying? Have you seen if he is upon guidance or if he enjoins righteousness? Have you seen if he denies and turns away? Does he not know that Allah sees? No, if he does not stop, we will drag him by the forelock, the lying, sinning forelock. Then let him call his associates and friends. This is come in a previous surah as well, the lying Hold on. forelock. Then let him call his, uh, you know, his associates. We will call ours. We will call, and, and who's Allah's associates? We will call the angels of hell. So why don't you call your friends and let me call the angels? And Allah says, no. Do not obey him, but prostrate and draw nearer to Allah. This is a, a verse He's, of prostration. Uh, this is believed to be talking about Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl, because uh, what, what he used to do was when during this time in Makkah, he would tell Muhammad, peace be upon him, that you are forbidden uh, uh, to pray in front of the Kaaba. 
because the way that he was praying, you know, going up and down and prostrating, it was, you know, something that was new for people and it was attracting people. So we said, uh, you know, this man in specific cannot come near the Kaaba and he cannot pray. And Muhammad, peace upon him, of course, being a prophet, he would continuously go against him and he would go and he would pray. So on one so, occasion... What is the first verses that were revealed? How is... Only the first five verses okay. are the first revelation. I told you entire surahs were, you know, were not coming down like this. Yeah, and one time he put the entire stomach of a... Intestine. Okay, so on one on one occasion, what happened was uh, Muhammad peace be upon him was uh, praying, and Abu Jahal got angry. He called his friends. He said that there is a camel that has been slaughtered nearby. Take the intestines of the camel, put it on his back when he goes down in sajda. So when he went down in sajda, the person went. He took all the intestines, heavy intestines, put it on the Prophet's back, and he was stuck in prostration. And he could hear everyone around him was laughing, and nobody was helping him, and he was stuck. He was down. And then eventually there was a woman who went running and told his daughter. And then his daughter came running from her house and then she had to pick up all the intestines and she had to help her father up. And so you can imagine he must have been down for a long time. He must have been down for at least a couple of minutes. And this is a prophet of God who's down and he has all these things on his back and everyone's laughing at him and he's stuck on the floor in prostration. He can't get up. So that's one thing Abu Jahl did. And then on a, on a second occasion, when he saw that the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, was praying again in public, and he had told him not to, so he advanced towards him as the Prophet was praying, with this intention that, that's it, I'm going to strike him now. I'm going to hit him so hard. And as soon as he came forward, he immediately, something happened, he got terrified and he moved back. And then his friends came up to him and said, uh, what just happened? You know, that you, you, were going to kill, you were going to hit him. And Abu Jahl said, I was going to hit him, but as I was coming close to him, I saw a trench between me and him. The trench was filled with fire and these, these very scary looking creatures. And it, it terrified me so much that it caused me to turn back. So he saw this thing and clearly he must now know that this is no less than a prophet I'm dealing with, but he still did not embrace Islam. And that was Allah's way of saying, enough is enough. You have uh, abused him many on many occasions. This time, back off. He's praying. And that's why Allah says, if he does not. And then, of course, the ultimate was Allah sent him verses. That tell the one who is forbidding a servant when he prays. Have you seen if, if he's upon guidance? In other words, the person who's praying. Have you considered that maybe that person who's praying is actually on the right path? Maybe you're dealing with a prophet of God. Maybe he is someone who is calling you towards righteousness, towards goodness, towards something which is, which is very, you know, which is uh, piety. He's calling you towards Jannah. Have you considered that? And for that reason, you are abusing him? Okay, and uh, have you considered the fact that he's not abusing your gods? He's not going to the Kaaba to open it up and to destroy your gods. He's not even touching your gods. So what's your problem? And oh, then, question, and hold on, uh, Allah it, it, saying, have you seen the one who is now denying and turning away? Does he not know that Allah is watching everything that he sees? If he does not stop, now this is Allah's threat to him. If he does not stop, I will drag him, we will drag him by the sinning and lying forelock. And what did I tell you about this? The forelock is this part, you know, mm -hmm. the front part of your brain, which, which is, is also... responsible for all the uh, thoughts that happen when you're about to do a bad deed. It's, it's believed that your prefrontal cortex or your frontal lobe is where the maximum activity takes place when you are deceiving or lying or thinking of doing something that is incredibly bad. That's where all of that stuff takes place. The, the activity over here is the most. So let's say we will grab him by that sinning and lying forelock if he does not stop doing this to our servant. And of course, Allah did do that. When did he do that? Uh, won't he win? When, when is it when Allah did that, when uh, this lying and sinning person decided to call all of his associates and Allah said, okay, let me call but my it, angels. But it, There's only one occasion when angels came. Yeah, it, yeah. And so that's why Allah says, why, do, why doesn't he call his associates? We will call our angels. And that's exactly what happened. The angels came. 
And so Allah says, no, if uh, don't obey him, prostrate and draw near to Allah. So now we start up with the next surah. This is Surah Al-Qadr. Allah says here, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Indeed, we sent the Quran down during the night of Qadr. Now, um, I mentioned to you this before. We also know in Surah Baqarah that the Quran was sent down during the month of Ramadan. Here Allah is saying we sent it down in the night of Qadr. So that must mean that the night of Qadr is in, Ramadan. Is in the month of Ramadan. Now there are different hadiths. Some say that um, it is there in the last 10 nights, so you have to find it. Some say that inside the, inside the, the, the last 10 nights, it's only the odd nights. So because we have two different kinds of hadith, that's why, you know, there is, uh, it could be the odd nights only, it could be the last 10 nights. But now most scholars say it is uh, in the last 10 nights. So just do as much effort as you can in the last 10 nights to pray and to find that, uh, that special night of Qadr because there is a lot of reward that is there for a servant who is praying during that time. Now, of course, Allah says, what can make you know? What is this night of Qadr? Uh, now, before I move on, what does it mean to say that the Quran came down in the night of Qadr? The whole book did not come down. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, it's either the last verses or the first verses. Wow. <laughs> okay, well, actually, half of that is right. Um, a lot of the scholars believe that the first five verses of Surah Alak came down in the night of Qadr. Okay? But... Besides that, Allah says that the Qur'an came down in the night of Qadr. Have you forgotten? Oh, 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 yes. Yes, yes. Yes, I remember it. I'm so happy you remember it. I just wish you could tell me what you remember. Uh, that, uh, you know, because all books are stored inside the Sidrat uh, al-Muntaha. What? No. Lowell Mahfuz. Oh, no, sorry. Lowell Mahfuz, right? Which is in the... Uh, a seventh heaven. Okay. So the Quran. Uh, from the, from from, from that. Qadr, yeah, from that. Uh, uh, from the mother of the books. Uh, the, it descends down to the lowest heaven. To the lowest heavens, and from there the system of revelation started. So the Quran remained down there in the lowest level for how long? Uh, how long did it take for the entire Quran to be revealed? Mm. Please don't say any number that comes to your mind. Nine, uh, 21. 23 years. It took 23 years. So that's also the reason why the lowest level of the heavens become became securely guarded because the Quran was down in the lowest heavens. And so then it had to be protected to make sure that no jinn can hear what verses are going to be revealed. Right? One question. Um... When it said that Rasulullah used to pray towards the Khana Kaaba, right? Yeah. But the Khana Kaaba was filled with the, the idols of the... Um, so? He's praying towards the Khana Kaaba. It doesn't matter. The Khana Kaaba is not God. Mm-hmm. It is a symbol of Tawheed. That's it. And at that moment in time, mm-hmm. they could not destroy the idols. Because when you are propagating the message of Islam, when you are giving a people an opportunity to hear the message, you cannot go around destroying their gods. They have to, um, uh, they have to want to uh, embrace Islam. You cannot enforce Islam upon them. So at that moment in time, Allah was giving them an opportunity to pay attention and to listen and to embrace Islam. But then ultimately, when the Muslims were given power over Makkah, that's why now they are in charge. So the first thing that they had to do was destroy all of the idols. Okay. So now uh, so it's very clear now when Allah says that the Quran was sent down, it means that it was sent down from the seventh heavens to the lowest heavens, whereby the system of revelation would then start. And also it's believed that the first five verses of Surah Alak were actually revealed to the Prophet during the night of Qadr. And so Allah says, what can make you understand how powerful, how beautiful this night actually is? The night of Qadr is better than a thousand months. And what's also beautiful about this is that the angels and the spirit, in other words, the Ruh, in other words, Jibreel, actually descend by the permission of their Lord for every matter. Peace it is until the emergence of dawn. So then the angels descend, including Jibreel, who only comes down when there is something like it is the time for revelation because he is you know, the very, very 
the biggest and the most awesome of all the angels. And he even descends. That's what makes this night so much more beautiful and so much more amazing. And they all remain down here on the earth until the time of Fajr. And they are here to, um, you know, basically by the permission of their Lord, they attend to all of the different matters. That is why many scholars believe that it's also called the night of Qadr because your short term in, uh, planning is being done on this night. In other words, what Allah wants for Rafi in the next year in terms of his risk, his sustenance, his tests, his difficulties, hardships, ease, whatever Allah has planned specifically for the next year, that short term planning is done on this night. So, well, of course, you know, when, before you were born, Allah had made a, 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 an overall long term plan for Rafi in terms of how long will he live and, uh, you know, overall uh, the total amount of sustenance, the total amount of, of, of risk that Allah will give Rafi. But that's, that was a long term planning. Okay. In terms of short term planning, it was okay. But for this specific year, what will I give him? What difficulties is he going to face? What period of ease is he going to face? How long is that period of ease going to be? How, you know, what is the intensity of that period of ease or that period of difficulty? That short-term planning is done for every single human being in the night of Qadr. That's what makes it it's, so, uh, it's a very powerful night, not just because there is so much reward. And that's why Allah says it's, it's better than a thousand months. It's a huge amount of ajr for just, uh, you know, be for praying during this night. But besides that, also from the hadith, we find out that if you're praying and you're really doing a lot of ibadah during this night, Allah will forgive your past sins. And besides that, it's also very important because it is in that night that Allah is now, He is forming your, your short-term plan for the next year. So pray as much as you can that Allah, please make this next year a year filled with sukoon, peace, contentment, risk, uh, barakah, wisdom. You know, grant me the wisdom uh, of this Quran and the ability to be able to connect with you. Right? Now, the next one is Surah Al Bayyana. Uh, again, a surah that was revealed in Makkah. So Allah says, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, by the way, this is believed to be a late, uh, a late Makki surah. So a surah that was revealed very, very uh, you know, towards the end of the period in Makkah. And some people say maybe it was also a very early Madani surah. It could also be that, so only Allah knows best. So here Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, those who disbelieved amongst the people of the book and the polytheists were not going to be parted until there came to them bayyana. And what is that bayyana? What is that clear evidence? A, a messenger from Allah who is reciting purified scriptures, you know, amazing, beautiful words of wisdom, within which are correct writings. So that exactly is what Bayyan is. First of all, we have to understand what is the difference between Bayyan and Furqan. Furqan is um, a particular incident or a thing such as, you know, this book of Allah, Quran, something or some incident that makes it so clear to you in one second in your heart that this is the truth and this is false. So it makes truth and falsehood absolutely clear. No doubt is left in your mind. It happens in one instant. And that is what you call Furqan. It, there's just no room left for you to have even a, a second of doubt. That's why the Battle of Badr was called Furqan. That's why Quran is called Furqan. Because when you really read it with an open mind, whether you are a Muslim or if you're, if you're a, a non-Muslim, the minute you start reading the opening verses, you start thinking, wow, this is amazing. This does not sound like something that has come from a human being. Understand? Uh, uh, the other day I was just uh, uh, reading an account of a Christian who converted to Islam. And he said, you know, when, when, I, when I opened this book, I opened it with the intention of trying to find out that for sure this book has been written by the devil. Because that's what I had been taught. And he said, what really grabbed my attention is that every, you know, uh, as soon as I opened it, the very first words were, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. And the translation was, in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate. And I said, a jinn cannot be talking like that. And then he said, besides, what I realized is in our Bible, we don't have any, any chapter that begins with 
you know, with something like in the name of the Lord, the most compassionate, the most merciful. We don't have a single one. And this Quran has 113 surahs out of 114 that all start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yeah. What is that one surah that doesn't oh, start surah with? Surah Al-Azam. No. What? Surah, no. Surah Tawbah. Uh, yeah, Tawbah. Surah Tawbah. Okay, so, so for someone like that Christian who came with such an evil intention, even just reading the first, the opening verses, even that was like, whoa, this sounds, this does not sound like a jinn. So th that's what becomes Furqan. Bayyana is something which is clear evidence that this is the truth and this is falsehood, but you will only be able to understand it when you do a lot of research. It's not something that will instantly, you know, it'll uh, hit you in the heart. You have to do research. So Quran is Furqan, but Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is not Furqan, he's Bayyana. Allah calls him he, that, that he's Bayyana because the more you think about this man, the more you uh, do, uh, you know, some kind of research on him that, okay, he was illiterate. He didn't have much knowledge. He couldn't read or write. How is he saying all of these things? Okay, he was always known to be honest, uh, you know, a man of great integrity. So why would he start lying now? Okay, so he's, he's spreading the message of God and he didn't ask anything, uh, you know, in exchange, no money, no wealth, no fame, nothing. You know, it's, you have to do research. The more you uh, uh, read about him, study his life, study the sunnah, study the hadith, the more you will understand this man has to be a prophet, right? You know, but it, it's not like, you know, the minute that Muhammad peace upon him says anything or you just look at him, you instantly think, oh, he has to be a prophet of God. You have to do research and study him and then, you know, it becomes obvious. So that's why it's called bayyana. All right. So this is what Allah is saying that the, the disbelievers and the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, they were all kind of living together as one big group, right? They were all sort of, um, they had made uh, alterations to their deen. They had made alterations to the message of God. And they were kind of helping each other because their basic idea was let's get power, let's get wealth, and let's become, um, you know, the most famous there in the world. Their intention was not let's spread the truth. You know, let's make sure that everyone understands the, the, the actual message of God and the purpose of life. The Jews were busy hoarding wealth. The Christians were, were, were busy trying to become powerful as well through the, uh, the entire Byzantine Empire. Okay, then you have the, the pagans, the disbelievers who were there in Arabia and Persia. They were, they were busy trying to amass wealth and power as well. So Allah saying they all were meshed up together, doing kind of helping each other because they just wanted power and wealth. They were not going to separate the people of the book versus the, the people who worship idols. They were not going to separate until came Bayyana, until came a, a prophet who was reciting these amazing words from this beautiful book. And what that means is, and what that means is when Muhammad peace be upon him came and he came with the message of God, that is when those Jews and Christians who were very sincere to their books, who were very sincere to their God, it was like a boost that was given to their rule. It was like they felt this massive guilt that we forgot this was the purpose for which we were created. And we were running after dunya. So what are we going to do now? Are we going to chase the truth or are we going to continue chasing falsehood? And those who wanted to chase the truth, they ended up supporting the Prophet. And the rest ended up following falsehood. So Allah is saying that these guys were all following falsehood and they were not going to split so, th so that the people of the book remember, hold on, we are people of the book. We were the previous ummat. We have this huge in uh, burden on us. What are we doing? That was not going to happen so that they could differentiate themselves from the, the pagans, from the disbelievers, until came Bayyina. And then when Bayyana came, some of the Jews and Christians were there to support Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, Allah yeah. is not a Bayyana for everyone. Like, yeah, it, it depends on the person, right? Uh, because for the, uh, for the jinn, uh, he was, I think, for Khan. No, 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 no. Because no. they did instantly. No. With no uh, doubt. No, no, no. Uh, he is bayyana for everyone. If you are able to understand him and pay attention to the words that are coming from his mouth, because don't forget, the words coming from his mouth were 
The words of God. Quran. They were Quran. And so when the jinn immediately, when they heard him, they were actually hearing Quran. And it was Quran that therefore, um, you know, they immediately testified to it. We know that the Quran is for Khan. The Quran is not Dayana. Okay, but if you are just looking at him, and if you are just uh, generally hearing him talk, because remember, it's not like everything that he spoke was always the, the words of God. Many times he was speaking his own words, right? It was the more you listen to him and, and uh, try to understand him, the more you, were, you would be convinced that he has to be a prophet of God. So a lesson, if you look at him, his sunnah, his lifestyle, his character, his honesty, that is Bayyana. Because then you will understand, oh, this man has to be a prophet. Understand? That's why every time Allah sent a Rasul, he made sure that the Rasul was selected from the people. So that they could look at him and say, we've known him since he was a child. He's always been honest. He's always been amazing. He's always been truthful. He's never worshipped gods. You know what? He has to be a prophet. Now you have to go back and think and examine and analyze, right? You have to ponder. So that's why prophets become bayina. Okay, when Allah sends a messenger, a messenger who is reciting beautiful words is Bayina. And so Allah says, so that split was not going to take place until came Bayina, nor did those who were given the scripture, in other words, the Jews and Christians, they were not going to become divided until after came to them Bayina. Now Allah is talking about Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. So now he's saying that when it comes to all the people who were there in the world, the people of the book versus the, the disbelievers, they were all meshed up. They were not going to separate until came Bayina and the form of Muhammad peace upon him. But then within the people of the book, within that one body, that one ummat, they uh, in fact uh, were not going to split until came to them Bayina, who was of course is Isa alayhi salam. So Isa alayhi salam told them that, listen, what have you done? You've changed the books. You've, you've, you've entirely distorted the message. You forgot your mission. And then those who felt that, yes, he's absolutely right, and they felt that guilt, they followed him, and the rest denied him. But there were only and 12 people who followed him. Initially. And then after, of course, he was raised, there were many other people who did, if you remember. Uh, I told you Titus came, and before Titus came, many of the Christians at that time were able to run because Isa alayhi salam had prophesied that when these things start to happen, that means there's a huge azab coming, so run. And so many Christians at that, at that time did. You understand? So during his lifetime, yes, there were 12 disciples, but he was raised at a very young age unexpectedly, right? And so as a result, later on, there were many people who did follow him. So that's what Allah... So in other words, what this means is every single time, uh, you know, every time you want to split between truth and falsehood, there has to be some bayina that comes. Every time bayina comes, that is when you feel that there is now a split, there is a rift, there is a divide between those who want to follow the truth because they have suddenly, you know, um, it jogs their memory that what am I doing? I completely forgot this was my purpose. Those who want to follow that and those who still want to follow dunya. You get it? So then Allah says, and um, so nor did those who were given the scripture become divided until after it had come to them bayina, and they were not commanded except to worship Allah, be sincere to him in religion, inclining towards the truth and to establish prayer, give zakat, and that is the correct religion. That's all Allah is saying that was asked of them, yet many of them still decided to distort the message and follow falsehood. Allah says, indeed, they who disbelieved amongst the people of the book and the polytheists will now will be in Jahannam, abiding therein forever. Those are the worst of creatures. Indeed, those who have believed and done good deeds, they are the best of creatures. Their reward with Allah will be gardens of perpetual residence beneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide forever. Allah being pleased with them and they will be pleased with him. That is for whoever has feared his Lord. So now Allah is saying, I've sent you Bayina. I've sent it to the previous ummah and it, it caused a divide because Bayana always causes a divide between those who want to follow now the truth and those who want to follow falsehood. And then I sent Bayana again to the entire dunya who was immersed in complete anarchy. And now Allah is saying those who follow that Bayana, you will get Jannah. Jews, Christians, Muslims, which means of course you have to follow the final prophet. And those who continue to follow falsehood, you will be faced with Jahannam. So now we have uh, Surah Zazala, 
another surah that was revealed in Makkah. Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When the earth is shaken with its earthquake, in other words, a series of strong earthquakes, and the earth discharges its burdens. What is a burden the earth is holding? The, uh, the, the human, human beings. All the graves, all the, all the people that have been buried inside of it who are dead. And man at that day, man says, what is wrong with it? Why is it shaking so much? And then Allah says, that day it will report its news because your Lord has commanded it. And what is this news it's going to be reporting? Uh, of, of everything that will happen on it. It's this going... The, you know, of all the news. It, about of everything that walks on it. It's going to be testifying against every single human being. It's going to be bearing witness. So not only will we have our own limbs and our own bodies are bearing witness, the earth will be granted a tongue and Allah will say, speak. And then the earth will speak and testify against every single human being and all the things that the human being did. And if you uh, remember... An example of this can be, you know, because we were told that when, the, when a Firon died, right? Hmm. Uh, the, the, the mountains, the heavens and the earth Mm. Did not a cry a single tear for them. Absolutely, yes. So this is uh, this is also part of it. The fact that you know when we could ask this question that how was the earth actually testifying? We know that uh, um, the earth during the time of Pharaoh, uh, when Pharaoh and uh, you know his entire army was completely destroyed, Allah says the earth and heavens nothing shed a tear for it. And the explanation of this was the fact that normally. Uh, when there is a righteous person who actually passes away, a righteous person who dies, then the gates of heavens actually close That um, because for every human being there is a gate from which his sustenance comes down and his good deeds actually go up. And that gate is then closed because that person has now died. And therefore the heavens uh, will end up weeping for that person because they end up remembering that person and the great good deeds that the person used to do. And the earth used to, uh, and the earth will weep for that person as well because it will remember all the good deeds the person used to do as he would walk around on the earth. In terms of praying, in terms of doing charity and helping people, the earth will also miss that person. But when it came to Pharaoh and his army, because they never did any good deeds, the earth, the heavens, nothing shed even a tear for that person. Okay, That's why we know that the earth will be able to report because it's watching you and it's watching everything that you say. So even the earth will testify against you because Allah will command it to do so. And uh, based on, the, on this particular verse, by the way, um, in the Hadith, Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, uh, he, he explained verse 4 by saying can you imagine what tidings it will relate in other words can you imagine on that day what are the kind of things that the earth will actually report and the people at that time they said allah and his messenger know best and muhammad peace be upon him said its tidings are that it will testify against every man and woman to the deeds that they did on its surface saying he did so and so on such and such a day that is that with which it will be commanded. So when Allah says that on that day the earth will report its news because your Lord has commanded it, all good things, all bad things done by every human being will be mentioned and it will be said uh, and the earth will say he or she did this on such and such date, on such and such time. Imagine that. Uh, unless you ask a forgiveness for that and it was erased, right, from the sin. Well, of course, that's up to Allah. If he has decided to erase it, then the earth might still be told to report it, but then Allah might say, okay, well, that thing has been forgiven. But what's important is the fact that you are being watched not just by God, but there are so many things that will testify against you. The angels on the left and the right who are noting everything down, your limbs, your skin, your eyes, your ears, and even the earth. So how can you possibly think that you will be able to get away from it on that, on that day? You cannot lie on that day. And so Allah says that day the people will depart separated into categories to be shown the result of their deeds. So good and bad and inside bad there will be different categories. Inside good there will be different categories depending on how good you were or depending on how bad you were. So Allah says so whoever does an atom's weight of good will see it. Allah will not be unfair to you and whoever does an atom's weight of evil will see it. Allah will not be unfair. Okay. So now we start out with Surah Al-Adiyat. This is an early Makki Surah. 
another beautiful surah which is uh, it was revealed in Makkah. So Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah swearing by the racers who are panting. The horses, yes. And the producers of spark when they strike. So what exactly is sparking? Uh, the rocks. Their hooves. The when, hooves when, they, when their they, hooves they, strike the rocks, they, you see sparks. And the chargers at dawn. So in the early hours of the morning when people are sleeping, that's when these horses are charging. They're... Uh, they're charging into enemy territory because they're about to lay ambush and attack the enemy. And Allah says, uh, stirring up clouds of dust. So you can imagine the horses are charging and there's all this dust that's coming up. And Allah says, arriving in the center collectively. So they go right into the center of the enemy ground and they attack. And after now talking about all of this, Allah says, what is the statement that he's giving? Indeed. Mankind to his Lord is very ungrateful. And I know the interpretation of this. And indeed he is to that a witness and indeed he is in love of wealth. His love of wealth is intense. Right. So what uh, is so the meaning? The interpretation of this, uh, uh, the horse is basically, you know, he's very um, loyal to his master. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because the master gives him food and of all of them and the horse is very loyal and you know a grateful back to him in the same way Allah is our master and he gives us a sustenance but we are not grateful in the dream. right Most absolutely so Allah is saying that when you look at the horse this beautiful creation I've made so muscular so strong so loyal to his owner that when the owner has to lay ambush to an uh, you know on an enemy tribe the horse does not fear for his its life the horse will go running right towards the center of the enemy early in the hours of dawn. Why? Because its master is commanding it to do so. And it doesn't care about the consequences. It doesn't care that, uh, you know, there are other people there and I might actually die. They, there there uh, might be a battle. The horse does whatever the horse is told to do. And it does it fearlessly, with courage, with conviction. That's why the horses are so beautiful and there's so much to learn from them. And Allah is saying, I've created them in this particular way that a horse is designed to be loyal to its master. It's loyal to uh, its rider. And so Allah is saying, when you have a, an animal that is so loyal, yet you have insan, who uh, Allah has done so much for, given insan so much, so much intellect and even beautiful gifts like the horse, yet insan is not, he's just, not loyal to God, he's not grateful to God, and he is terrified of charging into the center and doing jihad for Allah. The horse will do it, but insan will not do it because insan is so scared that I might just die. Because you have a nafs? Yes, of course, you know, we, we do have a nafs, and that is something we have a nafs and a ru, which the horses don't. But the idea being is Allah is saying, compare yourself, that that's why when you looked at suratin, Allah says that they become the lowest of the low, that they become lower than? The animals. the animals. In other words, even a horse, a, a, an animal like a horse actually becomes better than you because the animal, the horse is at least loyal to its owner. You as an insan, even you are not loyal to your master. So you, you've actually become worse than a horse. You've become worse than animals. Right? And this is what Allah is saying in this beautiful surah, the idea being to remind yourself that you need to go, uh, you need to be fearless. You need to charge in the direction of Allah, charge in the direction of Islam. Stop fearing the consequences. Stop fearing that if I do this, then this might happen and then I might die and then and so on and so forth. Do whatever your master wants you to with this courage and this conviction that my master is with me. He knows what is best for me. My loyalty is to my master. Right? Period. But Allah says the problem is insan is intensely in love with wealth. Because if he's afraid if I die, then what about all the, my money? What about all the other things that, that, that I could attain? You know, what about all the other enjoyment and comfort of this dunya? I'll, I'll just lose it all. So Allah says, but does he not know that when the contents of the graves are scattered, so the graves are opened up, everyone rises, and that which is within the chest is obtained, whatever secrecy are come out, indeed their Lord with them that day is going to be fully acquainted. So in, in other words, insan is... Um, you know, he, he lowers himself to becoming worse than an animal, that not only is he not loyal, but he stops using his intellect and his mind, and he's, he stops thinking 
rationally that how is it you can avoid jihad and end up getting away with it on the day of judgment do you not think that allah knows exactly what's going on in your heart and he he will hold you accountable because he's fully acquainted where can you possibly hide right so now we'll do with the next uh, surah which is the last one for today allah says surah al qariya this is another beautiful surah revealed in makkah allah says bismillah rahman rahim the striking calamity which is of course al qariya that is the striking calamity and what is the striking calamity and what can make you know what is the striking calamity why is allah saying this to um, uh, to uh, to emphasize it to make you understand that how can i possibly make you understand it it's so hard for you to imagine i'll i'll try and describe it but you won't be able to get it because it's beyond your imagination and allah saying it is a day when people will be like moths dispersed running around everywhere and the mountains will be like wool fluffed up allah is talking about the end of times right the great terror then as for one whose scales are heavy so heavy with good deeds he will be in a pleasant life but as for one whose scales are light not not many good deeds his refuge will be in a complete abyss and what can make you know what this abyss is it is a fire intensely intensely hot okay and now we do the another surah i think we can cover the next surah as well this is a surah taqathur taqathur is a surah that was revealed in makkah as well and allah says in here bismillah rahman rahim competition in this world diverts you competition running around chasing all the different goals of you know uh, grades exams career it it really just diverts you diverts your attention until when do you realize when you fail when you visit the grave oh when, when you visit failing. well failing in terms of dunya in terms of life but allah is saying the competition diverts you until you finally visit the grave no you are going to know and then allah says then no you are going to know no if you only knew with knowledge of certainty you will surely see jahannam then you will surely see it with the eye of certainty then you will surely be asked that day about pleasure about all the things that you did so what you can see is allah is saying it's happening it's coming it's real stop thinking that it's just a fantasy stop thinking it's just a story stop thinking that you know th- these things are just not real this jannah you know this is just a fantasy it's never actually going to happen it's coming jahannam it's coming accountability it's coming what can make you possibly understand that stop wasting your time before you hit the grave and now you can cry all your life in jahannam it's too late uh well, i have a question uh, does this first mean that you know a, a competition is you know a, a completely useless in your entire life and you should never do it no what it means is setting goals in your life makes you productive that's why allah has given you a smart mind so set goals in terms of grades career uh, marriage wealth set your goals but your ultimate goal your priority should always be allah which means that yes i'm going to work hard uh, for instance uh, in terms of my tests i'm going to work hard to finally get that 90% and, and and to get that a star but are you studying so much that you're not even getting up to to do your five time prayers there is a problem are you studying so much that you don't even give yourself 10 minutes to study tafsir because you say i just don't have time now your priority is not allah are you studying so much that you end up saying okay if i end up getting my 90% then i will continue doing my five time prayers and if i don't then i will leave allah now there's a problem you understand so there's no problem in setting a goal that's fine but your priority in your mind the thing that you are obsessed over has to be allah which means you're studying and studying and then you say oh it's time for zohar i have to go right now and then you're studying so hard and then you think oh it's time for asr i don't care how important this is i have to go for asr now your priority is different that does not mean that you are saying there's no point studying you know there's no point uh, acing my exam get the priority right in the same way career set goals for yourself but then pri- priority has to be allah so while you're striving for your career your prayer has to be important 
Your tafsir has to be important. And then make sure you're not earning haram. Make sure you're not cheating, fraud, corruption. You're doing anything and everything to get that career. Now your priority is not Allah. So set goals, but your mindset has to be Islam and your struggle. You get it? That's what Allah is saying. Allah is saying you get so much in love with it that you end up forgetting about namaz. You end up forgetting about Allah. And now just everything is okay. Just do, do whatever you can, you can to make the maximum amount of wealth. That's where it becomes a problem. Okay? So now, inshallah, we'll stop here. Continue on in the next lecture with Surah Asr. Assalamu alaikum.